Five days into Operation Mushtarak, NATO and Afghan forces claim control of most of the target areas as Pakistan confirms the capture of the Taliban's second man. Can the Allied forces soon claim victory on the Taliban or will the war of attrition continue? And with the rise of civilian casualties, can NATO and the government really win the hearts and minds of the Afghan people? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hod Abdel Hamid. The U.S. military is hailing the latest troop surge in Afghanistan as a success. Operation Mushtarak is aimed at clearing the Taliban out of large parts of the Helmand province that is said to have become at the heart of the Afghan drug trade. The operation is the largest offensive against the Taliban since the 2001 invasion. Over 15,000 troops have been sent in and around the city of Marja, considered to be a Taliban stronghold. The U.S. says troops now control large parts of the town and the Taliban are being defeated. But as James Bates reports, civilians are paying a high price for the alleged military successes. The bodies of 12 civilians killed in a NATO rocket attack are finally handed over to their relatives. The 12, including four women and three children, all from the same extended family, died in what NATO commanders have described as a tragic mistake. However, important details about what happened have not until now been revealed. Al Jazeera has spoken to two family members, one of whom was in the building when it was hit. Haji Abdul Karim explained they only moved to that compound because U.S. forces had earlier taken over their house as a firing base and they didn't feel safe there. Another family member, Hamadullah, says his mother, father, sister and brother were killed. In total, 13 people died, but the body of one man has not yet been found. The incident shows how difficult it is to get a clear picture of exactly what's going on in and around Marja. Helmand's governor, Gulab Mangal, invited Al Jazeera to travel with him by helicopter to see and speak to those injured in recent days. However, when we arrived at the U.S. Camp Leatherneck, we were told only the governor, not the media, would be allowed into the hospital. The rules of the hospital do not permit media inside the hospital, so we will take the governor over and the Marja elders, and they will interview the family, and they will come back here and give a press release. We've been invited by the governor to come and see him see the injured. I thought this was an Afghan-led operation. It is very much an Afghan-led operation. It is not our hospital, and we are bound by their rules, and those are the rules. A number of tribal elders were present. They didn't want to give interviews, but it was clear there was frustration and some anger about the civilian deaths. The military are proceeding very cautiously because they don't want any more casualties among the local population. At the same time, they know this cannot become a long and protracted operation because that risks frustrating those locals they're trying to win over. James Bays for Inside Story, Lashkagar in Helmand. Well, joining us today to discuss this further, in Kabul, Noreen MacDonald. She's president of the International Council on Security and Development. Also in Kabul, Shukriya Baragzai, a member of the Afghan parliament. And in Washington, D.C., Sebastian Gorka. He's a military affairs fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Welcome to the show. Uh, Shukriya Baragzai, let me start with you. What is the strategic importance of starting this operation in Marja? Thank you. The Marja operation, first of all, is not about security because Marja is the place which is the huge drug trafficking and drug mafias are over there. But at the meantime, I think with such a military operation, if the military joined the operation, if they're going to continue such operation, I'm sure the civilian casualty will may bring more difficulties and challenges because although today even people cannot trust the stability of the government of Afghanistan to be under control, at the meantime, the civilian rights there is really under question, particularly if any civilian were dying, it means that and the number of the insurgents, one family will go to be increased. At the meantime, there's the time that we need to trust building. I hope that the international force and plus the Afghan government should concentrate also about the 
civilian because merger and military operation, it have a A plan and B plan. And I'm not really sure how long as they're concentrating about the military, that long they're forgetting about the civilians, which is over there. As you mentioned today, also there's a casualty. And since five days, there's a huge number of casualties, which is we don't know the exact number, but it's probably more than 25 people till today we are talking. But at the meantime, I think the one critical problem is that is the Marja military operation will be the end dot for the Helmand political and uh, security crisis or where the Taliban will go because other provinces, for instance, Nimrod's province and other Kandahar provinces, they are really under threat because the Taliban have an exit way and people are really been afraid. Uh, today they mind and uh, uh, let's say bombs. These are the issues which is people cannot get okay, out of the Okay, let me put bring in Noreen McDonald. Do you think that um, such an operation will achieve anything in the end? Was it the right place to start uh, by hitting uh, the drug traffic more than trying to hit uh, maybe the Taliban strongholds? Yes, these, I mean, hard questions should be asked about why Marja was chosen and why now. Um, it's not um, a major military objective, it's not a major political objective, and if the troop surge is being used as a counter-narcotics policy, um, as an instrument of counter-narcotics policy, I think that should have been clearly stated from the outset. Uh, there are some real questions about the math here. There's 15,000 NATO and Afghan troops um, that have massed on this uh, western part of Helmand province. Um, I believe the count so far is 20 Taliban dead, um, perhaps as many uh, civilians, Afghan innocent civilians dead, many more injured. So the math doesn't really add up either. I mean, it looks like uh, it's going to be very important to political audiences in the United States uh, where they need support for this much needed troop surge. But it's not making immediate sense on the ground here in Afghanistan, either from a military point of view or a political point of view. Okay, Sebastian Korka, there have been many military operations in Afghanistan since 2001, up to 21 of them. Now, what is the difference with this uh, military operation? Well, let me start by saying I think uh, the figures quoted for the Taliban killed in Marja are not the ones that are being reported in most media. Uh, we have uh, figures that say half of the significant Taliban leadership in that uh, city has actually been killed or captured. That would be more than 100 individuals. Secondly, I, it doesn't make sense, especially in a country with Afghanistan's history, to separate the question of narcotics traf trafficking from warlordism and from the Taliban. To say that uh, one thing is being done under the cover of another label uh, seems to produce an artificial separation in, in a region where all these things overlap to a huge extent. Now, what is the significance of this current operation? I, I think it's clear if you, if you read the statements made by the ISAF commanders that they are committed now to taking on the hardest fight in the southern region. Now, maybe Marja isn't the center of gravity for the Taliban in Helmand, but the point is in a counterinsurgency, the classic way to proceed is an oil spot strategy. You establish sovereignty in an area and and then you hold that territory and you proceed to expand it. And I think this is exactly what the ISAF uh, officers and the so commanders are trying to do. So you're saying that they're actually uh, applying the same kind of military tactic that was applied in Iraq after the surge, which is go in, uh, clear, build and hold. So you're actually saying that um, troops would stay there for quite a long time. Well, it's not, look, counterinsurgency is never a cookie cutter approach. Every counterinsurgency is sui generis. It has to be examined and responded to in its own merits. Well, the difference here is in Afghanistan that I think ISAF and the commanders in Kabul and elsewhere have learned very much uh, in the recent experiences there in how to do this. And for example, in Marja, what do we have? We have an incredibly quick establishment of authority, a flag raising ceremony within hours of the first operations but already what did they have in place they had 
uh, Afghan administrators ready to deploy to exercise the sovereign capacity of the Kabul government in the region and almost 2,000 Afghan police officers ready to deploy as well. So here I think the difference is perhaps in contrast to, to Iraq that we, we already have in place the immediate capacity to transfer civilian authority to the Kabul government in a way that allows the military success to be translated into a civilian success. Well, Noreen McDonald, I mean, even if we put in some uh, Afghan troops after uh, the, the uh, areas have been cleared out, are the Afghan troops actually able to control the situation and keep security, considering that some of the most sophisticated armies in the world were not able to? Yeah, it's um, a real concern, I think. Uh, there's a lot of aspirations for the Afghan army and the Afghan police, but at the moment I think it's uh, widely recognized that uh, there are training issues, there's high levels of desertion and unfortunately very high levels of addiction as well. Um, you know, labeling um, Marja, which is really a minor Taliban stronghold, this initiative as a counter-narcotics initiative really goes against the new admi administration in the United States' correct positioning of saying they were going to put the Afghan people first. And we've heard today of forced poppy crop eradication um, in these areas going on while these civilians have left the area because of the fighting, uh, which means they're going to go back to find their crops destroyed and no way to feed their families. So uh, from a counterinsurgency point of view, this type of operation as a counter-narcotics operation is going to do exactly what we're not supposed to be doing at this point in time, which is undermining our relationship with the Afghan people. If we need a military and political success with the troop surge, which I think is correct, we've got to push back against the Taliban uh, momentum here in Afghanistan. There were many other military targets and political, of uh, political interest. They could have worked on clearing the road from Kabul to Kandahar to Lashkar. Big impact on Afghan civilians. Wardak province, south of south of here, south of Kabul, very important. Uh, the areas uh, on the Pakistan border, where we know we've got a lot of uh, Taliban coming and going. There's a lot of other military targets that had big significance politically here would make a big positive impact on the lives of Afghan people. So it's, there's just hard questions to be asked about why Marge and why now? What's the Afghan relevance to this military objective? Okay, Shukriya Barazkaik, maybe you can answer uh, the question about the timing, but I also would like to ask you is um, why did it, why did this military operation go ahead so soon, just a couple of weeks after President Karzai seems to be, seemed to be offering an olive branch to the Taliban, trying to find some, saying that he might have, there might be a way to reconcile the, the fighters and maybe to find some sort of, a, of, of negotiations with the top uh, leadership. And it seemed to be an initiative that the U.S. did not mind of, but then the, no time was given for that to happen. Why? I don't uh, believe that there's a kind of two different vision about the reconciliation issue, but the reconciliation have different steps. At the meantime, I'm sure it will be uh, bring again the lack of confidence for those Taliban, which is they want to join the reconciliation procedure. And today they will thinking, okay, uh, they for one hand they're asking us to come and be with us. At, at the meantime, from the other side, they are coming to kill us. But uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, this operation is not only about security. We agree that the counter narcotic issue is related to security, related to our lordism, related to Talibanism, but at the meantime, we also should tackle the international addresses for that uh, specific case as well. At the meantime, uh, my dear colleagues, they were just talking about the military operation. What about civilians, which is they are living there? You can, you can put yourself on the place of them. Why you were thinking about the such a peace message, which is, comes just a few weeks ago from the international community, as from the Afghan government side, that there will be peace and there will be talk and there will be negotiation. But at the meantime, there will be uh, a fire and there will be a fight as well. Um, I, I'm really concerned about the marja, which is today the circumstances, and I hope that this military operation will not only go to those direction which is they want to reach but at the meantime because civilians are there and we shouldn't bring more large number of people on the list of insurgents because I understand as an Afghan and I do believe that Afghan National Army National Police can control it but this is another question how long it takes for British to control small provinces since four years in Helmand province 
okay. with a large number Sebastian of Gorka. money which is they do? Let me just ask Sebastian Gorka. Uh, Shukriya was talking about uh, rising numbers of civilian casualties. Aren't uh, the pictures of civilian casualties really one of the best propaganda and recruitment tools for the Taliban? You have to be realistic about the process of stabilizing a country that has seen 30 years of civil war. If you want a peaceful resolution, there is one very important requirement for a peaceful resolution. The other side, whatever you want to call them, Taliban, warlords, they have to want a peaceful resolution too. If they don't, you are forced to use force. Iraq is a classic example. What changed in Iraq? Uh, after the Petraeus Doctrine was implemented, after Al-Qaeda uh, overplayed its hand, a very simple realization was arrived at, that the enemy, the people who are killing Iraqis, who are Iraqis themselves or foreign fighters, there are two types of individuals amongst them. There are the irreconcilables and the reconcilables. In Afghanistan, we have seen an attempt now to reconcile with those Taliban who will be prepared to come to the table to peacefully negotiate. But Sebastian I think Gorka, it's clear I'm sorry, out, how I think do you know the difference between, observers. how do you know the difference between a Taliban and a civilian? I mean, uh, our, our correspondents on the ground tell us that m many people are uh, civilians during the day and Taliban at night and this operation has been so uh, pre-announced that a lot of the uh, maybe hardcore Taliban have left the area before so where wh where are we going but you're, you're, you're missing the point of, of, of my argument. If you have people who are committed to using violence against their fellow Afghans, if they're committed to using violence against the state, against the federal forces and the local forces, you must respond with force to exercise the sovereignty of the country and eventually pr provide stability. If, if your enemy wants to kill you, then you are his enemy and you have to respond. You can't just lie back and wait for him to cut your head off or to kidnap your children or to force you into the drug trade. Civilian casualties will be a consequence of being forced to use military response when the Taliban and the warlords say, I'm not negotiating with Kabul. I prefer to exploit the Afghans and to maintain my drug trade. In that case, you must use force. And unfortunately, in war, there will be civilian casualties. Well, at the same time as Operation Mushtarak is, is continuing, Pakistan's military has confirmed that the Taliban's military commander in Afghanistan, number two to the spiritual leader Mullah Omar, has been captured. Senior U.S. sources have told Al Jazeera that Mullah Abdel Ghani's brother was taken in a joint U.S.-Pakistani raid in the city of Karachi. As the Taliban's top military man, he's been responsible for building up its fighting capabilities. He implemented a policy of guerrilla warfare, including the use of more roadside bombs. He issued a Taliban code of conduct, which called on avoiding civilian casualties. He was also responsible for hiring and firing Taliban commanders, and he was in charge of the Taliban's finances. Brader is said to have been a strict treasurer who controlled hundreds of millions of dollars, partly income from drugs trade and crime. Brader was also a charismatic and influential leader, and he demanded all Taliban commanders to spend two months a year fighting on the front with their soldiers. But Noreen McDonald, is his arrest significant uh, in any sense, or, or is just going to put temporarily in disarray the Taliban? Uh, well, I don't think it'll put them temporarily dis in disarray, because in fact, um, the system that he did put into place, I think, uh, is widely acknowledged because it's guerrilla warfare. Uh, to be sustainable without his, you know, regular presence. It, they've built the type of momentum and network in Afghanistan uh, that has a diffused authority. It's a major political achievement. Um, it's very symbolic. Whether it will actually have any substantial effect on the Taliban um, military momentum in Afghanistan is yet to be seen. What, what you have to look at is the fact over the last however many years, the Taliban have come back to Afghanistan, They've um, obviously done a lot of damage in southern Afghanistan. They've moved north to Kabul. They're north of Kabul. They're east of Kabul. Um, so they've got a very large footprint here. So they've got a wide sort of top management, middle management 
uh, system going. Uh, it's very important. I think uh, all those involved should be congratulated. Um, but I don't think uh, anybody should immediately assume this is going to put the Taliban on the back foot. Uh, Sebastian Gorka, would, would you agree with Noreen's assessment? If you look at the, 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 the expert in insurgency, the guy who really taught guerrilla warfare as an art form was Mao. And if, if you look at Mao, he understood an effective insurgency to be built primarily along what was called a political line of effort, which means people and resources. And I think this uh, success is, is, has a potential to be very damaging because this is an individual who, although he may have been close to commanders and charismatic, we know was very responsible for the financial underpinning of the insurgency. If you don't have money, if you don't have a cohesive coordination to the resource allocations in an insurgency, you're in trouble. So this could be more than just a political success. Okay, Shukriya Baraskai, what do you think needs to be done now? Uh, should this operation finish as soon as possible? And what is really uh, the plan B you were talking about earlier in the program? Of course, we need the operation to be finished as soon as possible because this is the need. As um, uh, uh, another speaker said that the consequence of the peace would be civilian casualty. Do you can answer me what is the consequence of civilian casualty would be? Today, we just right now, we are talking there's a civilian casualty. People don't have even access for the clean drinking water. They need doctor, they need medicine, they need food, and plus they need stability and security. The major important things is trust building between the community level, government, and international community. This is more important than anything else. Without people and community support, none of the peace will be a stable peace, and none of and never security will maybe establish. Therefore, as soon as we can, we should finish that war, or either we have to be careful as a force, as a government of Afghanistan, to protect civilian life as well. Because our target is not only the enemy. There is a civilian, which is this civilian, is more important than the enemy to be killed and to be die. And for sure, there is a group which is they are not accepting nothing in Afghanistan. They don't believe Afghanistan. They don't believe Afghans. For them, also, there is no way for peace and talk. Well, they have to be answered by a military operation. But what about the little child? What about the women? What about the community people? We have to kill the Muslim for the crime which is they never did. So they never suffered always uh, during the Taliban. And this is the time that the government should go with a better message to be more responsible. And if they don't start trust building right now between the community and the government and international forces, I'm sure the lack of honesty and trust will make continue and will make damage more security in Afghanistan uh, and specifically within a Helmand and other neighbor provinces. No, Noreen MacDonald, uh, isn't then, doesn't she have a point when she says that probably government trust building would be a more effective way of, uh, let's say, counterinsurgency, if you want to call it so? Uh, yes, the classic counterinsurgency approach is characterized by this phrase, hearts and minds. Uh, which also, you know, encompasses the idea of trust. Um, and I do think there's been some errors made in how this mission has uh, proceeded from the point of view of uh, the Shuras came in too late to give consent. Um, it's, it's cold weather. There was no provision made for where the refugees would, would be living. Um, you know, there's no field hospitals. There's a lot of things that could have been done differently. Um, it, we could consider it, hopefully, as a training mission. Uh, for a next military mission for the troop surge, it actually would have a major military significance and a, a political effect that was a really positive effect on the Afghan people. Um, surely this is going to end up being a PR success back in the United States. And, and perhaps, you know, the political masters chose this target uh, to make sure that they would have an early, easy win with the troop surge. Um, so we'll have to wait and see how this all plays out on the international stage, but surely from an Afghanistan point of view, here on the ground in Afghanistan, uh, I think we're hoping for something that has more military impact and, as was said, something that builds trust with the Afghan people.
Okay, we have already reached the end of the program, so I'd like to thank our guests in Kabul, Noreen McDonald, and Shukreya Barakzai, and in Washington, D.C., Sebastian Gorker. And thank you so much for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. We welcome your comments and suggestions. Please email them to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. Goodbye for now. <laughs>